Welcome, and I'm so glad you can join me for this workshop as part of the Live Life Well Weekender. I'm going to be talking about bread and about baking bread and about the benefits of baking bread for wellness. I just love baking bread and it's not just for the delicious and nutritious loaves that can be produced and it's not just even for the pleasure of the process. It's because I've realised that there are many life lessons and psychological benefits that I feel I personally have gained from baking bread. I work as a psychological therapist but I'm very aware that there are many things that we can do to help ourselves that are highly therapeutic but are not therapy. So things like walking in nature, gardening, filmmaking, art, baking and cooking and of course baking bread. But I think there is something very particular about bread. It has deep symbolic and cultural significance, so it resonates with us very deeply. It represents nurture and it represents that fundamental relationship between one human being and another feeding one another. One of the things that I get from baking bread is a sense of being grounded. I think many of us spend too much of our time in our heads these days. So to reconnect with our physicality, to do something with our hands, is actually very, very helpful. It's also a way of reminding us that we're connected with the earth, that this grain that comes from the soil, that makes the flour, that makes the bread, that feeds us, is all part of a pattern that we're very connected to. As well as grounding and soothing and slowing down that I get from baking bread, it also gives me an opportunity to practice mindfulness. It gives me a chance to be creative and it gives me a chance to go on learning and that's something that's very good for brain health. And I fully expect to go on learning new things about baking bread to the end of my days. I've baked bread for many years now when things still go wrong and it might be that a loaf will stick to the tin or it might be raw in the middle or there's not enough salt or it's underproved or overproved. And that provides one of the great life lessons of bread baking, giving us the chance to learn to accept imperfection. So getting all of this opportunity to accept the mistakes and the things that go wrong when we're baking bread actually helps us to be able to accept imperfections in ourselves. So the imperfect loaf that we all bake stands for the imperfect life that we all lead. And it's absolutely fine. The reality is that no one's perfect, we all make mistakes, and if we can be kind to ourselves and accept that, then it really helps us to counter perfectionism, and that's something that can help with reducing anxiety and low mood as well. One of the other really important things about accepting imperfection in ourselves is that it allows us to show self-compassion. Self-compassion is being as kind to yourself as you would be to a vulnerable child or to a dear friend, and if we can treat ourselves with that same kindness, then we're giving ourselves a really firm foundation for our mental health. I've written Bread Therapy because I want to share my love of bread making with other people and encourage other people to bake their own bread too. And I hope very much get some of the benefits that I've derived from it. So bake bread with love and pass it on. That's what it's about. I want to pass on to you some of the ways in which bread making is so special and exciting to me. So I'm going to read a bit from the introduction to my book, Bread Therapy. There's something about the metamorphosis of flour and water into a loaf of bread that is entrancing and that always feels a little miraculous. The realisation that with your own hands you can make something so delicious and nutritious from scratch is a revelation and easier to achieve than you might think. Once you can bake your own bread, you know that you will always be able to produce nourishing loaves for your family from store cupboard ingredients. But the magic of bread making is much more than this. The process of going back to primal principles of working with basic ingredients provides us with an opportunity to learn and to be creative in ways that can have a lasting positive impact on our well-being. I often think that there are parallels between being a bread maker and being a potter, mixing dough or clay, forming loaves or pots, and waiting to see what emerges from the oven or kiln. Like becoming a potter, to become a bread maker is to become a craftsperson. 
is something that will enrich your life as well as your larder and can become part of your identity, part of who you are, as well as what you do. The thought of becoming a bread baker might be quite daunting to you, and it is true that there are some sorts of bread making which can be very complicated, but they don't need to be. And today I'm going to show you two recipes for making very simple breads, very quick breads. The first one is going to be a soda bread, and the second one is going to be some flat breads with spinach in, which are very delicious and, and nourishing. Soda bread, as you will know, I'm sure, is, is traditionally a, an Irish loaf, um, would used to be made with sour milk, but I'm going to be making it today with buttermilk. Um, you can get the bag of flour out the cupboard and you can have a lovely loaf of soda bread on your table in less than an hour. So unlike yeasted breads or sourdough that use natural yeasts to raise the bread, soda bread is made with bicarbonate of soda and it needs to be mixed with something acidic, which is why we're using buttermilk. The recipe in my book talks about using wholemeal flour, 100% wholemeal flour, and that's absolutely fine. You can more or less use any mixture of flour you like for soda bread. Um, I've got here some wholemeal and a little bit of plain flour and some unbleached white flour, and I'm going to put that into the bowl now. You can also add some oatmeal. I've got a couple of handfuls of oatmeal here. Mix that in. Two more things to go in the dry ingredients. Some salt, a teaspoonful of salt, and a bit more there, and the bicarbonate of soda. And a spoonful of that is all you need. Don't be tempted to put any more in than you actually uh, have in the recipe because it can leave a, a bitter taste, so a spoonful there. Now we're going to mix this in thoroughly. It might be when you start baking bread, if you haven't baked bread before, that you have some worrying thoughts about it. Depending on what sort of experiences we've had of trying new things when we're younger, sometimes we're so afraid of failing or things going wrong that we think, I won't do that. I might look silly, my loaf won't be as nice as Pauline's, I won't be able to do this. But the way to overcome that is to actually try things and, as I said before, to be prepared to accept imperfection. It doesn't matter if it doesn't come out perfectly, you can always make another one. And it's nearly always edible, whatever you do. So there's the dry ingredients mixed for the soda bread. And I'm going to put the buttermilk in now. Um, you can't always get hold of buttermilk. And I tend to get it from a Polish shop where it's called Maslanka and it's much cheaper than um, buying it from some other more shishi shops where you get a very little bottle for not very much. But if you don't have buttermilk or you can't get hold of it, then there are two alternatives which work really well. One is to use yoghurt, plain yoghurt, you don't want any strawberry flavouring in there, mixed with the same amount of milk. So you're using the same volume, which is 450 mils, half yoghurt, half milk, mix it up. That works really well. The other thing you can do is to use the same volume of milk and add the juice of a lemon. Again, that will acidify it. So what's going to happen now is that we've got the alkaline bicarbonate of soda in with the flour and the oatmeal and the salt. And I'm going to add the buttermilk. And it'll be quite messy and it won't look really like the sort of stretchy dough you might be used to seeing with a loaf of bread. Um, and we'll make it into a rough ball and then we're going to put it on the baking tray. And it's really important not to spend too long over this because once the buttermilk mixes with the bicarbonate of soda, the chemical reaction will start and gas will start to be produced. So if we wait too long before it goes in the oven, it might deflate a little bit. So here goes. I'm going to pour that in. One of the things that you will realise about baking bread is that it's not an exact science. And although we have precise ingredients when we're looking at our recipes, the reality is that different flours have different levels of absorbency and we need to be able to be flexible and decide, do I need a little bit more flour? Do I need a little bit more liquid? Now this one's coming together quite nicely. I'm going to mix it with a spoon until it's more or less 
all incorporated. I think I might need to add a tiny bit more flour here to bring it together. On my hand, and now I'm going to start use my hands. It doesn't need kneading. Sounds like a joke. It doesn't need kneading because we're not looking at developing gluten in this bread, and it still needs a little bit more flour. We really just want to pull it together into a rough ball, and at the moment it's still falling apart a little bit, but we're getting there. Okay. And when we've got our rough ball of dough, I'm going to sprinkle some flour onto this baking tray to help it not to stick. I'm using baking parchment here, which is brilliant to stop things sticking. Um, and I actually reuse it. This one I've used a couple of times already. Why it's, it's why a little bit yellowy rather than um, than white. Okay. So we've got our lump of dough, which is sort of actually still being a little bit imperfect here. I think I need a tiny bit more flour to hold it together. There's always something you can do if things don't turn out quite right. So. Put this on here now and form it into quite a flat round. The next thing we need to do is cut across into the top. This is a very traditional thing for soda bread. Um, there are some tales about it being to do with letting the fairies out or other religious significance, but the reason which is the most pragmatic one is that it actually helps the loaf to bake. Food. So I'm using a knife to do this because you need to cut quite a long way through, about half of the way through the bread. And you can see it's already starting to separate out because it's starting to, to rise. So that's ready to go in the oven now for about 35 minutes. One of the areas of bread making which there's a lot of mystique about is sourdough bread baking. But this is the sort of bread baking that people have been doing for millennia. Um, there's something very special about it because we're starting off with flour and water. We'll be adding a bit of salt when we actually make the dough for sourdough bread uh, at some point in the future. But this is the very first stage of sourdough baking I want to show you and that's called mixing the starter. So unlike yeasted bread that has baker's yeast in it, or soda bread like I made earlier that has bicarbonate in as the raising agent, the raising agent for sourdough bread is all around us. It's in the yeasts that exist on the surface of the flour, possibly in the water. This is not mains water, so it may well have something in it from our hands, from the air. And the bacteria and the yeasts are what produce the rise in the loaf. But it takes much longer. But the fact that it takes much longer means that the flavour is wonderful. So we need to be patient. So the first thing I'm going to do is put this rye flour. Rye is the best flour to start off our starter. We don't have to make rye bread if we've got a rye bread starter um, because we can use any flour for the next stage but rye seems to work very well. And this is organic flour, which is even better because it means it hasn't had some of those yeasts and things killed off by pesticides. And as I say, we're lucky to have non-mains water, um, which hasn't got chlorine in it, which again, you don't want to be killing off the healthy bacteria and, um, and yeast. So adding this now, and if you do have mains water, which I know most people do, then one of the ways of getting rid of the chlorine is to pour a jug of it overnight and just let it stand and the chlorine will evaporate off. So this, I think that's enough water now, is a lovely, lovely sludgy mix. Looks a little bit like runny putty. It's quite brown because of it being rye. I can smell it already. It smells like 
It smells like rye biscuits. It smells like breakfast cereal. It's a lovely smell. So really that is it and it's absolutely fine to get your hands in it and your fingers in it. In fact you sort of want to because you want to be able to. I'm just breaking up some of the little lumps there. To make good use of the healthy bacteria that are on the, the microbiome that's on your skin as well as the one that's inside your guts. There. Okay. So that now is the starter that you're going to be growing over the next possibly week, sometimes as little as four days, sometimes it takes a bit longer than that, depending on the temperature and and other variables. So it needs to be in a container that you can cover so that you don't get any flies or bacteria you don't want going in, but you don't want it to be airtight either because the pressure will build up as the gas starts to be produced as the fermentation happens. So these plastic containers are what I use. I think if you reuse plastic things then they can be actually okay. Um, glass is not brilliant because the pressure can build up and crack it and, and smash it if it had a, a tight lid on it. So every day that will need to be fed and we would keep it at room temperature and add approximately 60 grams of flour and 125 mils of water but you'll get used to that just being two tablespoonfuls in a good slosh you don't have to measure it out every time but it's important that you discard some of the starter when you're doing that refreshing in this building up phase um, and the reason for doing that is that you need a little amount of starter that's very well fed for to help it to grow and develop Whereas if you have a lot of starter and a little bit of feeding, it's not going to be so uh, likely to become active. So at this stage, you do throw that away. Um, once you've got an active starter, which I've got an example of here, then you don't throw the discard away. You actually keep it because it's precious. Bread is precious. And when you make your own bread, you will realise you won't want to waste a single slice. You will recognise how precious it is. And that's how things should be. We, we waste far too much food. So once a day, you're going to throw half of this away, add the flour and water, stir it up. And after four or five days, you'll start to notice, maybe before then, maybe later than then, bubbles starting to appear. And that's a sign that your starter is starting. It's actually becoming active. And once you've got it to the stage where it's really regularly bubbling up, then you know you're ready to bake with it. And then the recipes in my book, how you can use that starter to make some delicious, wonderful bread. So there's a very young starter. Here's a slightly older starter. So this is one I've just taken from the fridge. It sometimes gets a little bit of a skin or a bit of liquid on the top, but it's, you can smell that yeasty, beery sort of smell. So I'm going to get rid of part of that and I'm going to put it in this tub. There's quite a lot already of sourdough discard. It sort of seems to keep for at least a month. And you can make crumpets, you can make pancakes, you can make all sorts of things. You can just add a bit of your sourdough starter discard to other bakes that you're making. So I shall pour some of that in there. Leaving not very much, almost just what's lying in the dish. So that will get mixed in there. And we'll go back in the fridge. As I say, it's important to keep it in the fridge. Things can go wrong with this, but it's really important in baking and in life to ask yourself, well, what's the worst that can happen? The worst has happened to me a couple of times. Once um, I had my sourdough starter in a kilner jar, in a, in, a, in a jar, which I didn't close the top on tightly, but was over vigorously stirring it and the whole bottom of the jar fell out and all of my starter, a sea of broken glass, went over the floor and that was the end of that. Another time something had gone a little bit wrong with the fridge and it wasn't cold enough and I noticed the different sort of smell. So I've talked about this beery, yeasty smell, a little bit sour, which is healthy and right. Um, and this was a slightly different rotting smell and there was pink growth on the top which is actually not what you want at all so that was anything like that any black mold or pink mold 
the whole thing has to be chucked out. But the worst that can happen is that you just start again, and it's fine. You'll have in a week's time um, a starter that you can bake with. So we've got the remainder of this mature starter here. I'm adding some flour and I'm adding some warm water. The consistency of people's starters varies hugely. I'm always fascinated by looking at people's starters. That sounds rather rude, but um, some people have very runny starters. Some people have starters that are almost like dough. They're so thick. And it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. As long as there's enough moisture and enough food for the starter, it will come back to life. So when I've refreshed a starter like that, and again we've got sort of putty consistency here, which is the sort of consistency I like. Again, don't worry about getting your fingers in it, I've washed my hands, and the healthy things that live on our skin are actually something that is a good part of baking. So this will be kept out of the fridge now until it starts reviving, bubbling up again, and will be ready for baking. And that might be in about 12 hours time, or it might be less than that. Again, it depends on how warm your kitchen is, but um, that's really how we make a starter in the first place and how we refresh a starter so that we're ready to bake with it. One of the things about this process, which I feel is just so important, and for me, I think, is the the single most important lesson of baking bread, and sourdough in particular, but baking any bread, is that it's this very powerful metaphor of transformation, that we start off with something fairly unprepossessing, and we end up with beautiful, delicious, nutritious bread that we can feed ourselves with, being part of good self-care, and we can share with other people, building our relationships with others. And this reminder that transformation is possible, that we can all change, is massively, massively important. It's never too late. There's always things we can do to change. Um, and often it's the inner changes that will make the most difference rather than things in the outside. So every time we lo bake a loaf of bread, we can be reminded that there may be things in our lives that we want to change. Knowing the difference between the things that we can change and not, of course, is very, very important. But it is true that sometimes we act as if we can't change some things, but actually we can. So this is some of the ways in which baking bread has helped me to understand myself better and to make sense of, of some of the things that we all struggle with in, in everyday life. Um, being able to become more mindful, becoming more accepting of imperfection, being able to encourage our inner observer so that we have the freedom to choose of some of the things that we think about and, and feel, and reminding ourselves that change is possible, that transformation is possible for all of us, are just some of the things that I talk about in my book and why I just love bread making so much. The bread I'm gonna make for you now is a spinach flatbread. So it's a flatbread which means it's got no yeast in it, so it's not going to rise. It's made with wholemeal spelt flour, which is very nutritious, as is the spinach. And it's only got four ingredients. It's got the flour, it's got the spinach, it's got some water and a little bit of salt. Flour is very important. Um, I think if you're going to take the trouble to bake your own bread, you might as well get the best quality flour you can and flour that's been stone ground, especially organic flour. And wherever you are in the country or even the world, there will be somewhere not too far away that's a traditional mill that produces really, really good quality, nutritious flour, and you can taste the difference. Now, the first time I made this loaf, I got quite upset and disappointed because I thought, brilliant, this wonderful bright green spinach colour is going to create these lovely vibrant flatbreads that are going to look so amazing. As they cook, they actually change colour, and they're meant to, but I didn't know that. So they turn from a rather bright green to a rather khaki green. They taste wonderful, it doesn't matter. But it's a very good example that I'll talk about a bit as I'm making the bread, of how we think about things having a major impact on how we feel. So I'm gonna make the bread now, and the first thing I'm gonna do is put the flour in the bowl. And I'm going to add 
just half a spoonful of salt. So there's less salt than you would have in a normal loaf of this amount of flour because it's not going to puff up, it's just going to be quite dense. So this needs to be mixed in and then I shall leave this and move on to the spinach. The spinach is going to go into a pan and wilt. So I've got 100 grams of spinach here. Spinach is one of those things that takes up a lot of room until you start to cook it and it goes down to nothing. But that's fine, it needs to wilt for this recipe. It needs a small amount of water, 60 mils of water. We might need some more water afterwards, but for now, that is what we need. So, as the heat starts to get to the spinach, it will start to mush down. So I thought to myself when I first made this, and it wasn't the bright green I expected it to be, that I'd done something wrong. And I think that that's a really important life lesson, that quite often things when we're baking don't turn out quite as expected. And it makes us realise that the way we think about things has a major impact on how we feel. And it'd be quite understandable to think that what we think and what we feel is automatic, that somehow um, we can't do anything about it. But the reality is that we can do something about it. We are not our thoughts. We're not our emotions. And there's actually a part of us that can observe those thoughts and emotions. And being able to observe and notice what's going on gives us the freedom then to be able to change what we're thinking and feeling. So if I find myself thinking, oh, this isn't what it's meant to be, this looks horrible, it's not bright green, I've done something wrong. I can notice that I'm thinking that thought and thinking, well, that's really quite negative. Is it helpful to be thinking like that? What's another way of thinking about it? It's turned into a different green, it's fine. Nobody knows what it was meant to look like in your own mind and it tastes really good and that's what matters. So learning to wake up and develop that inner observer, the part of you that can observe the thoughts, observe the emotions, is very, very important. It is a very basic and important tool of helping ourselves to keep our mental health well. So this is starting to wilt down now. It's taking its time, and that's all right. And all of a sudden it will go. What I said before about the flour applies obviously to spelt flour, which we're using for this recipe, but actually it applies to all the different sorts of flours we might want to use. From, but if it's stone ground and it's organic and it's wholemeal, then it will be a good nutritional value. Okay, so that's wilted now. So back to this spinach, it's going to go into this little tub with the water. We'll probably need a little bit more water because we're going to make it up to 230 mils. There it goes. And now we will whiz it up. At the moment it's looking like a very unpalatable smoothie and not that smooth. Now I need to get the little bits that are stuck off there with a the knife and see how much volume we've got and see how much water we need to add to get the right amount. Okay, we need a little bit more water. about it now. Give it another whiz. <laughs> Slightly messy. And I'm then going to mix this thoroughly in with the flour. It's important to mix it thoroughly otherwise you can get some bits that are more spinachy than others. There, I think that'll do for now. Most of it out. Okay, so back over to the flour. And you'll see when I pour this in that indeed it is a lovely bright green. And that's what I thought it was going to be like all the way through. But what you'll also see is that 
once it starts to heat up, it changes colour. And this is something that, as you see, it doesn't take very long to make. You can make them freshly and eat them straight away, or you can wrap them and keep them and heat them up again. Um, and they're just so much more interesting than a, a plain wrap. I mentioned before that flour differs hugely in how absorbent it is, and so although I've said 230 mils of the liquid, it might be that it needs a tiny bit more water or a tiny bit more flour, but we're getting there now. So as ever, when we get to the stage where it's coming together, I'm going to get my hands in here. Getting your hands sticky is an important part of baking bread, and it is true to say that as adults, we probably don't play enough and get our hands in messy things, so I think it's a, another good reason to be getting our hands into a bowl of dough. So this is the dough now in a rough ball, and I'm just going to put some of that flour on the work surface. Move that over there. And it's lovely and warm, and I'm going to divide it into six. So. And each one of these will become a little ball. And each one of these will be heated individually. Okay, they're not all quite the same size, it doesn't matter. I'm going to move those over here. I'm going to pat them down. So you could use a rolling pin, but it might stick and you don't really need to. Um, and you get a much better sense of how thick it is and that it's even if you use your fingers. So this is going to be quite a little one because it's one of the smaller lumps, but that's absolutely fine. Remember, the imperfect loaf is a very good reminder that we are imperfect and it doesn't matter, it's fine. It doesn't change our value, or our value is intrinsic. We're all important as individual human beings and it's not what we do, whether we make mistakes or not, makes us valuable. We are valuable. Okay, so that pan's probably just about hot enough now. And this is probably about as big as this one is going to get. So I'm just going to pop that on the pan. And these are the sorts of breads that you can really make at short notice. There's nothing like being able to give people, your friends and your family, something you've made yourself with your own hands. I love doing that. I've got a big family, so I have lots of mouths to feed when everyone's here, which is lovely and rare. And I often give people bread as presents. I think we mostly have too much stuff. So to give people things that will be used up and have been made by hand with love is actually, I think, one of the best presents you can give. So one of the things that you can do whenever you're making bread is to use it as an opportunity to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness gets a lot of press and there are many different forms of mindfulness. But at its most simple, it's a matter of focusing on your senses. The truth of the matter is that we can only really think about one thing at a time. So if we force our attention onto what we can see, what we can feel, what we can hear, what we can smell, what we can taste, then we can't at the same time be thinking worrying thoughts or thinking about what happened last year or what might happen in the future. And that's actually a very helpful skill to have um, because it helps us to train our attention. If we think of our attention like a muscle that needs training, this one's done now, then the more we're able to take control of our own attention, then the more beneficially we can influence our own mental well-being. So if you think about anxiety and depression, both being difficulties which rob us of our attention. So if you're prone to anxiety, then your attention will be constantly being grabbed by worrying thoughts about things that might happen. What if this? What if that? If your mood is low, then you will tend to have your attention drawn to things that have gone wrong and difficulties. 
or worries again. And if we're able to consciously say to ourselves, this is not helping thinking about this, I'm going to think about something else, I'll think about this later, then actually that can make a real difference to our mental well-being. And training ourselves using mindfulness is a way of helping to get better at being able to pull our attention onto what we want to pull it onto. And the more we develop mindfulness skills through things like baking bread mindfully, the better we are at being, to, being able to be this observer of our own thoughts and emotions. And then we can start asking ourselves, is this helpful? Is this what I want to be thinking? Is this actually getting me where I want to be? Or am I repeating old patterns that actually don't belong here, they belong from somewhere in the past? This one is just about ready to turn over. It's a little bit like when you're making pancakes, the first one is never very good. But does it matter? It does not. We can't always control things happening in the outside world, or indeed what colour a flatbread turns into. But we can control about how we think about it, and how we feel about it. Um, and that no one can ever take that choice away from us. We have that choice. And we can either think about this as a wonderful, tasty, nutritious flatbread. Or we can think about it as something that isn't bright green. But I know which one will lead to you or me feeling better about ourselves and the world. And we can make that choice. And there we have them, some spinach flatbreads. Here's the soda bread out of the oven, looking lovely and golden. And it smells absolutely wonderful. It never leaves me the thrill of taking a loaf of bread out of the oven. No matter how long and how many loaves I bake, um, I feel very fortunate to have found bread baking as a way of expressing myself and really extremely fortunate that three of the main strands in my life, um, my family, I've got six lovely grown up children, uh, my work, working as a counsellor, as a therapist, and then being a, a bread baker, have somehow all come together. And they're all ways of letting people know that they are cared for, that they're important and that they are loved. So I feel very, very grateful that those three main strands of my life have come together now and have ex found expression in the book, in the book Bread Therapy, which I've written, which I very much hope encourages people to, to bake their own bread. And one of the wonderful things about soda bread is that you can, you can cut it when it's still warm. So I'm going to cut into this bread, I'll cut it down in the middle, and it's a reminder that one of the best things of all about breaking bread is it's a way of connecting with other people and sharing bread with other people. They say you don't fight with people you break bread with, so that's that very nourishing soda bread, all done. So one of the really wonderful things about baking bread is that it allows us to connect with other people in a very special way. But not just the people, our family, our friends that we share our bread with, but with our ancestors, with people in the past who have baked bread, and with people all over the world. It's very hard to find a food culture that doesn't have some form of bread in it. I hope that by watching me baking bread and talking about it, that I may have connected with you in some way and maybe encourage you to bake bread as well and allow you to connect other people through baking bread. So remember, you can bake bread with love and you can pass it on.